that uh, Achebe uh, didn't really care very much about women. And even worse, some, some people thought that he, um, and perhaps still do, I'm not sure, uh, but there was scholarship uh, in, that suggested that Achebe didn't like women. <laughs> and on that preposterous, I, I wondered whether the people had re really read his novels, but there is no doubt that he gives more in his five novels, more attention to men, to male characters than female characters, but it's very telling uh, how he, uh, of I believe his, his orientation to women, how he uh, portrays them and treats them in his novels. Anyhow, after that book was published, I, I decided to start investigating uh, not only his writings on, on women, but also other uh, Nigerian and Igbo authors uh, who, who were women. And, and their connection to Achebe. So I'm going to give you a little sliver of that today. Now, um, just for, uh, just for, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, <clears throat> logistical reasons, I'd like to ask you to interrupt me at any time for whatever reason, to ask a question or, but I know that there will be questions and answers afterwards and also to let me know uh, when I'm running out of time, I, I I think that this will fit pretty well into the time frame. But uh, Sharbani, is it correct that I have about half an hour now? No, you have yes, you have more half an hour, thirty five minutes. Okay, all right. Well, um, if I'll I'll try to keep track of that. So now in the those thirty thirty five minutes, will that also include the questions and answers, or or will that be no, after? No, no. No, 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 no. We, after that, we will have the questions and answers. Fantastic. Okay, great. Okay, everybody. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint. I will present my paper by right, word right. of here um, and the wonders <laughs> of the internet. Uh, this, this paper is entitled Women and Self-Possession in the Writing of Chinua Achebe, Flora Nwapa, and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And uh, I'll, I'll also say that my, my inroads, the, the, the focus of, of, this, uh, sto of this discussion is a novel by Chinua Achebe, but I try to branch out a little to talk about other authors as well. Uh, but the, the basis is, um, his novel, A Man of the People, his fourth novel, which um, may be my favorite of his, of his fictional writings, actually. It's uh, not just because it's short, it is really quite short, but um, maybe in a standard edition about 140, 150 pages. But uh, it is, it's one of those books that every word counts, uh, every little plot detail you realize if you read it again and again, it everything fits. And, um, and it's, uh, I think an incredibly modern story, even, even today, even in 2020, even though it was published in 1966. Um, and, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but it's, it, but it's a novel. Part of the reason I say all those nice things about it is I don't feel that it's uh, nearly as studied as uh, some of his other books. Uh, Achebe, as I'm sure many of you know, is one of the most renowned, um, not only African writers or West African writers, but global authors. And I believe that Charbani told me that you, some of you have studied his first novel, Things Fall Apart, um, which uh, is, I think, one of the most uh, widely uh, assigned readings among secondary and university students around the world. Um, it's somewhat ironic that I, I, in my own experience, I have the feeling that it's replaced uh, a famous British novel called Heart of Darkness uh, as the book that 
people read these days if they're going to read any novel at all that is set in Africa. And the reason that I think that's ironic is that um, <clears throat> apart from Things Fall Apart, Achebe's first novel, the piece of writing that he did that sealed his reputation was a critique of Heart of Darkness uh, in which he accused uh, Joseph Conrad, its author, of racism. But as I say, th that book, Things Fall Apart, is the one, including in the United States, that if uh, is if any student encounters a book by Achebe, it'll be Things Fall Apart, which is an, a fantastic book and a really important statement in many ways. But as I say, um, he, A Man of the People is, is exquisite in its own way, very different kind of story. Uh, it's kind of a satire and a, a modern kind of political um, thriller in a way almost. Um, and... Uh, but uh, I think that Achebe's own favorite amongst his novels was his third novel called Arrow of God. These are all really important works. You can't just say, oh, well, the only important one that he did is, is, is Things Fall Apart. Um, these are very important stories. And when I say important, not just because they're good, good books to read, but they have had such a massive influence on other African writers uh, and writers around the world and audiences around the world. Uh, I'll say one more thing as a way of introduction to Chinua Achebe and his oeuvre is, is that, uh, that, uh, that uh, one, again, one of my favorites of his works is uh, his second book called No Longer at Ease. Many people don't realize that it's a sequel to Things Fall Apart, uh, which again is a little bit ironic because uh, I think that a, a lot of students, when they read Things Fall Apart, are disappointed at the end because it seems that the ending comes so suddenly and, and, uh, and that all of a sudden the book is over just when uh, the events are reaching their climax. So it's kind of um, uh, abrupt ending. But what they don't realize, um, unless they have me, to teach it to them is that there's a sequel to it called No Longer at Ease. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a strange sequel since it takes place not in the next generation after that of Aconquo, the, the protagonist of Things Fall Apart, but, but, but really two generations later, even though Aconquo's son in Things Fall Apart is a character in that second novel called No Longer at Ease. All of these are, are really important works. Anyhow, uh, Chinua Achebe's fourth novel a Man of the People, published in 1966, depicts a wider range of dyna dynamic female characters than any other Achebe fictional narrative. Indeed, the variety and vitality of the women portrayed make the female presence as central to the Nigerian-born author's purposes as that of the male characters, even though Achebe's readers would have to wait until his fifth and final novel uh, from 1987 called Antils of the Savannah, to encounter a female character, Beatrice Oko, who could be classified as a protagonist. Uh, but she's a protagonist along with two male co-protagonists, Chris Arrico and Ikemo Sodi. So even there, she's not the central character. A Man of the People, the, his fourth novel, the, um, I should mention that uh, his fifth and final novel, Antils of the Savannah, which I just mentioned, was published in 1987. A Man of the People in 1966 was his fourth novel. And so uh, at a glance, you might wonder why was there such a long um, hiatus between the two novels? The first four came in quick succession, and then all of a sudden, a 21-year hiatus. Um, I think the answer to that is very complicated, but Achebe himself has suggested that um, it had a lot to do with the horrendous Biafran War of 1967 to 1970, which um, he, he was part of Biafra. He was a spokesperson for Biafra. And as you know, uh, it was a um, overwhelmingly devastating um, war for all of Nigeria, but especially the people of Biafra. And I, 
I think um, many of them would say that they never recovered from it. And I think that to some extent that might have been true of Achebe. Um, a man of the people, by the way, famously anticipates uh, the Biafran War. And because, and when we, when I get to that part of it, I'll try to show you that uh, there's this uncanny uh, kind of prophecy in A Man of the People, published in 1966, the Biafran War really started in late 1966, but it's, it's actually dated to 1967. Anyhow, uh, A Man of the People suggests that it's unnamed African nation, nation a version of post-independence Nigeria, will not fulfill its potential without fundamental socio-political changes, including the tangible evolution in women's selfhood and leadership roles. The opposition, the opposition between women's aspirations and the daunting familial and communal limitations imposed on them mirrors the independence era struggles that unfold in Achebe's tale. So, uh, Nigeria, which the nation in, in the book is based on, gained independence in 1960, and this book was published in early 1966, so it's really very much a, a, a book of post-independence Africa. The work's very title, the Ma A Man of the People, as well as its story, resonates with these political themes. The title that is a man of the people, asks whether the newly independent African nation belongs to the man, represented mainly by the title character, Chief the Honorable Micah A. Nanga, a corrupt member of parliament and minister of culture, or to neo-colonial interests represented by a, a fictional company called British Amalgamated, or to the military who launch a successful coup d'etat at the novel's end, or, remember it's man of the people, to the people themselves. The implication throughout Achebe's story is that the last of these, the people, are the only rightful possessors of the nation, an idea that 21 years later, Antils of the Savannah would render explicit, explicit mm, I beg your pardon, explicitly in Beatrice's voice, she says in Antils of the Savannah, Savannah, this world belongs to the people of the world, not to any little caucus, no matter how talented. Yet in practice, the people are dispossessed of their common inheritance and the fulfillment of their talents through, and I quote here, corruption and political ineptitude. These are terms that Achebe uses in his final nonfiction volume for the post-independent circumstances that arose in his homeland in Nigeria. The, his final volume is a book called There Was a Country. It was published the year before he died. That is, he died in 20, 2013. Uh, and it, it basically is a, a memoir of the Biafran War, what led to it and what followed, but it's also a memoir of his momentous life. Corruption and political ineptitude are the national maladies that a man of the people explores. But Achebe leaves no doubt in a man of the people that the political system that would most benefit the people is a, cl quote, clean democracy, and that the coming election, despite the prospect of violence it entails, augurs a faint hope of salvation for the country salvation from, among other scourges, political corruption. In keeping with the narrative search for fundamental, fundamental political fairness and reform, the novel also implies that women, while central to the family and larger community, belong as possessions neither to the man with authority nor to the nation, but rather to themselves. While none of a man of the people's women are the central actors, the ones on which this study focuses are crucial to the novel's plot, and Achebe establishes their subjectivity in the spaces they do inhabit. According to Oyinamichi Udamukwu, Udum, quote, feminism is animated by a desire to reconstruct history in order to reconstitute the woman as subject. 
This implies that the woman is presented or represented not as a mere object of history, put at the margin, unquote. A man of the people's leading female characters emerge from the margins precisely because the text humanizes their personal predicaments and validates their choices. Their sympathetic collective voice rivals in significance the insistently egocentric voice of their male counterparts. Achebe's title, A Man of the People, implies that a particular male, Chief Nanga, should be responsive to the will of the people, but the story reveals a socio-political norm in which the people, and women in particular, exist to serve and enrich the male. What complicates the situation is that the people tolerate some degree of venality among their leaders, those who have scaled colonial and independence era barriers to positions of formal power in the post-colony. They do not believe, to use a, a quotation from the beginning of the book, quote, that a sensible man would spit out, would spit out the juicy morsel that good fortune placed in his mouth, unquote. Significantly, Achebe has made clear in his had made clear in his second novel, which I just mentioned, No Longer at Ease, set at the end of the colonial era, that corrupt practices were not simply a matter of African custom. And here's a quotation from um, an African in the civil service in No Longer at Ease. You think white men don't eat bribe? Come to our department. They eat more than black men nowadays. Unquote. Furthermore, in his memoir, There Was a Country, Achebe remarks that, quote, in a sense, Nigerian independence came with a British governor general in command, and one might say popular faith in genuine democracy was compromised from its birth. Within six years of this tragic colonial manipulation, Nigeria was a cesspool of corruption and misrule. In spite of these circumstances, a man of the people suggests not only that the new nation deserves a clean democracy, and clean is the word that the narrator uses, but also that the nation belongs to men and women alike, and moreover, that women belong to themselves. At the same time, the novel recognizes that the female share in the possession of the nation and the very idea, idea of female self-possession have been culturally prescribed. Women are discouraged and prevented in the world of the novel from owning themselves, from realizing the selfhood and autonomy needed to direct their own lives, much less the life and direction of the post-colony. Still, while a prevailing independence era concept was that, quote, that the, quote, project of liberation for women had to defer to the men's project of achieving national liberation, unquote, a man of the people indicates that suppression of women's manifest potential impairs both their own capacities and those of the nation at large. The most dramatic portrayal in A Man of the People of a woman seizing possession of her life rather than submitting to mere victimhood at the hands of masculine authority occurs toward the end of the novel when lawyer and political activist Eunice shoots and kills the corrupt minister for overseas training, Chief Simon Coco. The minister is a member of the ruling People's Organization Party, and he and his henchmen have just assassinated Eunice's fiance, Max Colamo, by running him over in one of Chief Coco's Jeeps, missing Eunice by a few inches in the process. Coco attacks Max because of his work for candidates of a new party, the Common People's Convention, in the coming election, despite accepting. Coco's bribe to not stand in the election against Coco himself. Once Eunice shoots Coco, she is surrounded by his goons, underscoring the grave danger that her action entails. Eunice's murderous act is, represent, is represented as shocking, but admirable by the narrator, Odili, Odili Samalu, whose reflection on the assassination, I'll just call him uh, uh, Odili from now on, whose reflection on the assassination of Max and Eunice's revenge brings a man of the people to a close. Odile remarks, um, in such a regime, you died a good death if your life had inspired someone to come forward 
and shoot your murderer in the chest without asking to be paid. In effect, Eunice dispossesses a corrupt political party of its hold on governmental power and signifies that women can be decisive agents in the political destinies of their nations. This is not to say that Achebe expressly advocates homicidal violence or military coups to resolve electoral turmoil. Rather, he shows that political corruption incites violence and that women, like men, may resort to physical aggression when pushed beyond endurance. Eunice's desperate action entails heightened drama because physical violence stands as a male prerogative elsewhere in the novel and because, in the deed's aftermath, Eunice's own life would appear to hang in the balance as she finds herself at the mercy of Chief Coco's thugs. At this point in his narration, however, Odile <clears throat> ignores these men, negotiation, negotiating instead his apparent discomfort with an admirable female character turning homicidal. He hastens to mention that after slaying Chief Coco, Eunice modulates into more suitable, suitably feminine traits. And here's a, quote, a quotation from his narration about that. Only then did Eunice fall down on Max's body and begin to weep like a woman. And then the policeman seized her and dragged her away. A very strange girl, people said, unquote. The masculine order channeled by Odile, among others, avoids inclusion of aggressive power exercised by women within the same conceptual realm as that enacted by men and reflexively contests constructions of feminine agency that threaten to do so. <clears throat> now I'm going to move ahead in the story to, or not move ahead really, but move to uh, a different but related situation. Uh, the main character, the title character is Chief Nanga and <clears throat> He, for a while in the novel, uh, takes Odile, his former student, under and the relationship falls apart because a, of a romantic triangle. So uh, this, will, th this will lead into more discussion of, of possession and, and its relationship to the treatment of women in this novel. What causes the rupture in the relationship of the novel's narrator, that is Odile, with Chief Nanga, occurs in the temporarily absent Margaret's bedroom, Margaret being Chief Nanga's wife, which is adjacent to Nanga's bedroom. Odile expects to resume intimacy with Elsie, the student nurse who was Odile's lover during his final term at university. But instead, Chief Nanga avails himself of the opportunity to be with Elsie in his wife's room. Elsie undoubtedly aware, is aware of the penalties, including male denigration to which a sexually independent woman is subject, but she ultimately pleases herself in her physical relations. In, character, in characterizing Elsie, certain commentators follow the lead of Odile's and Nanga's degrading epithets for her, but this is to participate in their self-serving bias for Elsie exhibits the very qualities of sexual autonomy and self-possession that each of these male characters find worthy in a man. Such a gender-based distinction, wherein a sexually aggressive man shows, quote, prowess, and a woman it, and a woman is, quote, a common slut. These are terms Odile as narrator uses in precisely this fashion epitomizes the familiar double standard that Achebe submits for consideration and ultimately challenges in A Man of the People. Women in the novel repeatedly transgress the approved societal formula for modest and submissive conduct. Well, Elsie's sexual encounter with Chief Nanga partly is the product of his carefully maneuvered sedu seduction of her. It should also be noticed that the process is reciprocal, that Elsie likewise seduces him. She sympathetically participates in Nanga's banter, laughs at his humorous remarks, sits between him and Odile in his chauffeur-driven Cadillac, and possesses him. The attraction that she exerts on Nanga, moreover, prompts him 
to violate the relationship that he has fostered with Odile. The reversal in Nanga's fortunes commences with this violation. The triangle involving these three shifts into the competition between Nanga and Odile for a priv privileged relationship with Edna Odo, a competition that Nanga loses. Odile initially pursues Edna with the purpose of avenging himself against his former patron for the betrayal with Elsie. Later he finds, no doubt with a streak of rationalization, that he loves Edna and that he wants Edna now, I'm, I'm quoting him now in his narration, wants Edna now, if not all along, for her own sake, first and foremost, and only very remotely as a general scheme of revenge. In the latter half of the novel, before Nanga and other members of the government are jailed in the aftermath of the coup, um, and I guess that's, uh, I, I will just go back to what I was uh, mentioning before, which is that at the end of the novel, the military takes over the, the corrupt government. And the narrator, Odile, wonders whether there might not be a counter coup uh, in its wake and what a disaster that would be for the country. And those of you who know Nigerian history at all know, modern Nigerian history at all know that m pretty much that's exactly what happened in 1966, uh, which is that a, a, a group of young uh, military officers uh, launched a coup against the corrupt government of what was widely perceived as the corrupt government of Nigeria at the time. And at um, a later point, not much later, there was a counter coup of those uh, Igbo dominated military officers. And what proceeded from that was persecu persecution of Igbo people around Nigeria which led to the declaration of the independent state of Biafra causing civil war in Nigeria. The, the, the toll of that war uh, is still, well, nobody really knows how many people died from war and, and starvation, but um, it's widely accepted that in the millions uh, of Biafrans died. Uh, from starvation and, and, and violence. <clears throat> in the latter half of the novel, before Nanga and other members of the government are jailed in the aftermath of the coup, Edna quietly shows Odile the affection that he has sought. Edna determines through this process which man she will join, as Elsie has done before her. For Edna, the pressure to choose someone to marry is unavoidable, given her father's arrangements with Chief Nanga and the benefits that accrue from this. Despite her father threatening physical violence against her, Edna lets Odile know with a look that she is warming to him after his recent attentions to her, ostensibly on behalf of her ailing mother, and afterwards writes him an affectionate letter. And there's more gestures that, that uh, show Edna actively returning Odile's affection, even though she's engaged to be married to Chief Naga. Prior to these events, it seems certain that Edna will marry Naga, but this is circumvented by, among other factors, Edna's maturation. She becomes more comfortable in the assertion of what she wants for herself. Perhaps, as Odile ref reflects, she had simply grown a, grown a little more since October. Whatever the reason, she was now a beautiful young woman and not a girl looking as though she was waiting to be taken back to her convent. Edna, in short, has come to own herself a little more. That, that's in quotations. To own herself a little more. <clears throat> a term that Chimamanda Adichie connects to Americana's female protagonist, Ifemelu. Um, and uh, Adichie is the younger Nigerian Igbo author who I, th I believe considers Achebe 
to be her mentor uh, and to to um, be her role model as an author. And so all of her books, she's she's still quite young herself. She's published three novels and one um, volume of short stories, all of her novels and many of her short stories pay tribute in one way or another to the influence of Chinua Achebe. So in Adichie's second novel, Half a Yellow Sun, which focuses on the Biafran War, the aunt of the protagonist, Olana, insists to her niece, quote, you must never behave, behave as if your life belongs to a man. Your life belongs to you and you alone. As w <clears throat> so, the fact that Adichie, Adichie repeatedly dramatizes her own thematics of possession in regard to women is not merely a matter of paying homage to her forebear, but also a sign that any gains women have made in modern Nigeria are precarious, that the male urge to control them remains, a vi remains vital including among those with extensive formal educations. A passage in, Adich in Adichie's Purple Hibiscus, her first novel, spoken by Ifioma, a university lecturer, and the narrator, Kambali's aunt, reveals that one of Chief Na <clears throat> uh, reveals that one of Chief Nanga's methods for taking possession of Edna from her father, that is paying her school fees, only became more elaborate in later years. And this is what uh, Ifioma, Ifioma says in Purple Hibiscus, Adichie's novel. Quote, six girls in my first year seminar class are married. Their husbands visit in Mercedes and Lexus cars every weekend. Their husbands buy them stereos and textbooks and refrigerators. And when they graduate, the husbands own them and their degrees. In the traditional environment that Achebe represents, substantial time to grow as an individual, to obtain a fuller education, and thereby, thereby to own oneself more fully is precisely what women, including Chief Nanga's um, wife, Margaret Nanga, often are denied. Margaret recalls to Odili that Chief Nanga and his people kept at me to marry him, marry him. And then my own parents joined in. They said, what did a girl want with so much education? So I foolishly agreed. I wasn't old enough to refuse. Edna is likewise very young and has relatively little education at the time Nanga begins negotiating for her with her father. Achebe leaves no doubt that early marriage in which the young woman has little if any discretion is dis is disastrous for the fulfillment of her potential on terms that she embraces a man of the people implies that edna before acknowledging her interest in odalie has needed to internalize that marriage to chief not <clears throat> has needed to internalize that marriage to chief nanga does not augur well for her in her situation in her situation the daughter of poor villagers the realization has not been easy. Has not been easy. Nanga is used to getting wants in various spheres. He belongs to the first group of political leaders since his nation's independence, and inhabits the neo-colonial space that theorist Franz Fanon describes in *The Wretched of the Earth*. Corrupt individuals in a colonized or formerly colonized nation who selfishly pursue their own advantage rather than their nation's. Fanon remarks that, quote, the national middle class disappears with its soul set at peace into the shocking ways, shocking because anti-national, of a traditional bourgeoisie, unquote. Chief Nanga has used his governmental position and mutually beneficial relations with foreign companies to enrich himself and to build in his home village a new four-floor home next to the one he already has there. Odili describes Nanga's other residence, the one in the capital of city of Bori, as, quote, a princely seven-bathroom mansion, unquote. As with home acquisition, so with women. According to Odili, Nanga is, quote, 
a man who had so many women ready to make themselves available, unquote, and has five stories to every one of mine involving tales of female conquest. And I'm ending a quote there. In trying, moreover, to placate Odalie after sleeping with Elsie, Nanga makes an offer of women. Quote, if you like, I can bring you six girls this evening, unquote. I mean, he says girls, but uh, in the context of the novel, um, it's pretty certain that he means young women. In gaining independence then from the claims on her made by Naga, who has paid her bride price, education and other incidentals, Edna Oda, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> Edna Odo decolonizes herself. At the same time, Edna's defiant self-empowerment may be traced to generations of women whose personal strength Achebe attests in traditional village characters like Mama Ikwefi and Hannah Akonkwo. Here, one also may note Ifuru, the title character of the novel by Achebe's Igbo contemporary Florin Wapa that was published in the same year as A Man of the People and that had Achebe's attention as early as 1962. The claim by Ifuru, a pre-Nigerian independent market woman, to her right to self in the face of traditional norms bears some res resemblance to Edna's. Ifuru twice chooses the man she wishes to marry and twice claims the right to exist as her own person rather than as the possession of those husbands. Ifuru is mistreated by both and after making extensive allowances for the two, she leaves them and returns to the home of her father. Ifuru compares her abandoned abandonment by her first husband to the ultimate loss of self-possession to another. Adizua, that is her husband, has treated me shabbily. I'm quoting now. Adizua has treated me shabbily. He has treated me only the way slaves are treated. God in heaven will judge us. Unquote. Ifuru defies community pressures <clears throat> by claiming her independence from the husbands, but in returning to her father's home, she also abides by the traditional imperative that a woman be subject to a male relative's authority or indeed ownership. Similarly, Edna leaves the man who has paid her bride price, that is Chief Nanga, although mistreatment of her by Nanga, such as the pushing incident, does not appear to be the cause, but rather that she does not want him and disdains his corrupt wealth. She says to Odell at a certain point, he is no better than any Bush Jaguda man with all his money. A Jaguda man is a um, is a, a, a grifter. Another reason, of course, is that Edna is drawn to the much younger Odile. In choosing him as her partner, Edna, and I'm quoting Adichie here, owns herself a little more, refusing, like Ifuru, in, a late, in relation to Adizua, to be treated as Nanga's slave. Ifuru may have been the first novel to be published by a Nigerian woman, but it is far from the case that women's contribution to African literature was minimal until that point. As Achebe de declares in his memoir, the literary harvest from Africa today owes a great debt to female African intellectual forerunners. These griots, orators, and later writers played an indispensable role in recording, molding, and transmitting the African story. By boldly mixing numerous African and Western literary traditions in a cauldron, seasoning them with local color, and spicing their tales with the complexity of the human condition, modern women wordsmiths have deepened our understanding. That's the end of Achebe's quote about the storytellers who preceded uh, modern African novelists. And long before Achebe wrote these words, he embodied them in his work, for in his fiction, the storytellers are women. Things fall apart and no longer at ease include scenes in which a mother, Ikwefi and Hana, re respectively, tells a, folk tells a folk story to her child. These folk tales and their transmission to, from mother to child corresponding, correspond to Achebe's own observation in Africa and her writers, an essay that he wrote that our ancestors created their myths and legends and told their stories for a human purpose 
including no doubt the excitation of wonder and pure delight. Their artists created their works for the good of the society. Equefi and Hannah share in the fulfillment of this purpose, embodying a cultural attitude that children benefit from learning some part of their community's cultural tradition. In paying tribute to the role of women in Igbo storytelling, Achebe represents women as possessors of a narrative tradition while his own portrayal of women, including in A Man of the People, pushes back against traditional views of women themselves as possessions, as slaves to normative repression and exploitation. That's uh, not quite the end of my uh, paper, but I see that I've run out of time. So I think that's a good place to pause for the moment. Thank you so much. Tom, Shorab, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Tom Lin, for your beautiful and insightful presentation. Now it's time for the question answer session. Welcome. I request Oshim Kumar Betal, Department of English, Unatana Mahavidalaya, to begin the question answer session. Hello, Oshim, are you there? Yes, yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Please read out, audible? read out the question. Yes, you are audible. Please read out the questions in the chat box. I hope there are some questions. Oh, um, yes. uh, so audience, please, please type your questions in the chat box, please. And anyone of the faculty here? Yes, uh, um, first of all, I have a question. May I ask a question, Professor Bethan? May yes, I yes, ask yes, a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma uh, thank you, Tom, for that wonderful yes, paper. Yes. It, uh, thank it, you. Uh, it was a different light to the HEB that we normally know. <laughs> so we are now, you know, relearning our uh, awareness of him. I love that bit where you said that the husband would pay for the education, would pay for the car and the food. He would so own everything and then he would own the wife and the degree yes that was that was a fantastic because the it, it somehow corroborates to the uh, uh, modern indian scenario because we still have arranged marriages and if you go to the um, marriage uh, advertisements you will find they want educated highly educated girls they want doctors engineers professionals and then they also want them to be perfect housewives and very fair and pretty. Uh, so do you think that the female commodification has not stopped right from the days of you know, ancient times, right from the epical times, shall I say, from the time of Helen and from the time of Sita in Ramayana here? Is the commodification still there? Uh I, I believe that it's very much there. Um, it has grown ever more sophisticated um, and disguised. In fact, it, it makes me want to share a little anecdote with you uh, as, a, as a point of analogy. Um, this, this, uh, this story that, that I focused this paper on, A Man of the People, uh, is, is set in the 1960s and uh, and as you know from from the paper, um, is uh, very concerned with governmental corruption and bribe taking and so forth. And it it just so happened. I won't go into the details, but it just so happened that I uh, several years ago formed a friendship with Chinua Achebe's son, Chidi Achebe, and um, at at that point, I had never been to Africa, and and I asked him whether the corruption portrayed in um, that the that the situation of governmental corruption portrayed in a man of the people has gotten any better in Nigeria, and he said it's gotten worse. It's just it's gotten worse because it's more disguised now, ever more. Sophisticated uh, with electronic um, methods and disguises and and fronts, 
Well, I think that uh, I think that Adichie's stories tell us that the same kind of manipulations of 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 women and their educations and so forth are still going on, but it's um, it, it it it's less blatant to the eye. It it seems more concerned with the woman and more um, uh, and offering her a better life, but perhaps some of the same rudimentary uh, instincts to possess everything that the woman has uh, is still at play. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lin. This is uh, Boyjanti Mukherjee, and uh, we want to ask a question. Does achieve it through this movie provide a roadmap or a sort of Bible for colonized African states? Any colonized states to achieve the decolonization from colonial or imperialist forces to symbolism? In this respect, can we say this is a modern or feminist novel by far, which is in Iran, Pakistan, better represented by previously colonizing individual or people? Um, Sharbani, I, I have to, uh, and Dr. Beitel, I have to tell you that my connection <clears throat> was extremely poor. I couldn't make out what you were saying. I'm I'm so sorry. So I, I'm Sharbani, would you be able to? Uh, yes. Tell me what the question was. Sh should I? Yes, the question is: Does Achibi, through this novel, provide a roadmap or a sort of Bible for colonized African states or any colonized state, for that matter, to achieve a decolonization from colonial imperialist forces through symbolism? And then uh, the question adds: In this respect. Can we say this is a modernist and feminist novel by far, which is in turn better represented by a previously colonized individual or people? Well, um, I would say that A Man of the People is a modernist novel. I, I think that um, <clears throat> Achebe's great influences in the art of the novel were modernists themselves uh, and even earlier novelists. And um, I think that even though there it is a satire in some ways, essentially A Man of the People, like Achebe's other novels and, and uh, later short stories, are, if you had to pigeonhole them, you would say that they that they represent modern modernist realism, um, and I think, in fact, my original thesis for this <clears throat> for this paper was simply to declare that Achebe is a feminist. Um, I told you that there was a whole school of thought years ago that had him pegged as an anti-feminist. Um, in fact, I, I had an argument at a conference once with a Nigerian woman over that very issue. Um, <laughs> I, I, I tried to be humble and, and modest about it because who am I, a man uh, from the United States? But, but it, it seems so palpable to me that Achebe is, is attempting to, and I, I believe succeeds in voicing the, the, the objectives and the disappointments and the dreams of African, of, of Nigerian women, if not African women, if not, <clears throat> you know, all uh, oppressed women. And yes. so, yes, I, th I think that, uh, that it is a blueprint for, challenging the the kinds of selfish assumptions that peop that <clears throat> people in positions of elite power have um, 
not only toward women, but very much toward women, but to the, their own privileges. And, and, that, and that understanding how it works and how these deceptions are made and, and the assumptions that they're based on would indeed help people deconstruct them, I believe. Right. Uh, uh, Sharbandi? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I have an add on question, actually, uh, Dr. Lin. Uh, uh, when I was when I was going through the question that you have just answered, uh, actually uh, I found that there is a mention of the word Bible. Okay, uh, whether uh, the text, the novel, is a kind of Bible to the colonized people, how how will you uh, look at it? The use of the word Bible, because you know the uh, how how the African people uh, contested the the Christianization. Uh, because because uh, I have I have read uh, HEB as well as in uh, Gugio Thiongo because I made I, I uh, wrote my PhD thesis on Thiongo's novels and Thiongo uh, wow. in many of his novels uh, he's, he's he is actually uh, challenging and critiquing the use of uh, Bible that that the colonizers came with Bible in one hand and weapons in the other hand okay so how will you look look at the word Bible. Do you will you will you uh, will you will you say that it was a kind of uh, critique that Achibi is critiquing the Christianization, the Westernization, or will you say will you stick uh, to the perspective, the critique of Achibi that Achibi is actually a Western writer? Actually, his brain was trained in the European atmosphere, though he is trying to uh, he is trying to write something post-colonial, but he still he still sticks to or is indebted to the the western canon how will you look at it well when i uh, heard the word bible uh, a few moments ago yeah. um didn't interpret it literally <clears throat> um that it was a kind of scripture to people uh and that's why i used the word blueprint <laughs> later on um yeah. Although I will say this, that that uh, I, that it have a stature in in Africa, not not for everybody, you know. And Gugi Watiango and and Achebe had their differences. Not, you know, not everybody revered everything that Achebe had to say. That there was plenty of controversy, um, but but nevertheless, the model that he set of 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 being able to um foreground the beauty and the wisdom of african storytelling and african uh uh oral traditions and so forth and 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 turn them into books that were read around the world um he he was almost deified for that i, I it, it, he was really a hero and i i it's just a coincidence, but one of my other very favorite anecdotes uh, from Chidi Achebe, his son, um, that he shared with my students and me multiple times, <clears throat> is that when Nelson Mandela um, was freed from Robben Island, um, he, at, at some time after that, when Mandela was president, Achebe went down to South Africa and accepted a prestigious award. I don't remember what it was, but there they were. And 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 Nelson Mandela um, had made was it was famous for having said that his you know one of his favorite activities that made him forget that he was in prison was reading Achebe's books. So there they are together in South Africa at some great. Um, event and celebration and people started, you know, bowing to them as if they were gods and Achebe and Mandela, you know, sort of were very um, self-deprecating. <laughs> no, we're just ordinary men. Uh, don't do that. We're, we're, we're ordinary people. Uh, and um, I, I don't think that um, Achebe felt that anybody should be put <clears throat> on the level of a god. I'm not even entirely sure. Well, I won't go there. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go there in, into certain matters I don't know enough about. But 
in terms of religion and Achebe, but um, but I do think that that anecdote reflects on something I do want to say, which is that no, I, I don't think that most Africans who read Achebe think of his this or any other of his works as literally scripture as a kind of a Bible. But yeah. on the other hand, um, think about <clears throat> any book that you've read in your life that had a huge influence on you, that that changed you, that lifted you, that transformed you spiritually. Um, and so while they might not be tantamount to being like Bibles, um, I would say that that their influence and prestige are uh, are very high indeed. Maybe not scripture, but but very high. I know that there was still another component to your question, but I, um, <laughs> okay, it's, all right. it's all right. We are there, are some, there are some other questions here, Tom. Sure. Uh, Ankita Datta, one of our students, asks, "Sir, I would like to ask what could have possibly been the reasons." that Achebe could not repeat the same success that he had with Things Fall Apart? What a great question. Um, see, it's a complicated question, see, and there's a complicated answer to that. You probably understand from my earlier comments that I'm not at all sure that he didn't repeat his success because especially a man of the people and no longer at ease for my money are on the same level of things fall apart. But I, but in terms of <clears throat> being widely known and, and also world sales of, of the book, no, they don't hold a candle to things fall apart because, um, because two, I would say two interrelated reasons. The first is, that things fall apart addressed a fundamental question that had gone unaddressed for centuries. Like no other book had <laughs> that I'm aware of. And that question is, what is the African person's perspective <laughs> on the colonizing project, on the bringing of Christianity, to go back to that previous issue, and, and, all, the, and all the bad and some good, which Achebe acknowledged that colonialism brought with it. What we had were books and books and books and books and books about the white perspective of what Africans were like and how they felt about their white visitors, their European visitors. But, but while Achebe wasn't the only one who, who said, okay, now it's time for the African perspective, um, his, his particular story of a great man and his community who are invaded, I'm talking about things fall apart now, of course, who are invaded by um, missionaries and, and, and a colonial government and that destroy that man um, it, uh, was the perfect story in a way to capture the attention of people as to giving them a taste of the toll that colonialism had on colonized people. Um, of course, this applies to India and, and other colonized places. In fact, Achebe told more than once the story of of going to, to to South Korea and listening to stories of what it was like to be colonized by Japan, you know. So, um, but that particular story was, in a way, if I'm being very glib here, but was the right story at the right time uh, that yes, people were willing to read a story about an African village besieged by colonialism and, and what not the white perspective was on that, but what the African perspective was on that. So 
Um, um, but I think related to that, there's something else. I know I answered this at way too much length, but but this is very important to me. My own personal feeling about things fall apart, which is that it is a modern novel, but it in but it <clears throat> um, assimilates African oral tradition and something else that's almost intangible, that it's almost hard to put words to, but it has a mythic quality to it. A, a Conquo story has a mythic quality that you might uh, associate with Odysseus or Rama or, or, um, uh, uh, um, or Oedipus, that it, it transcends its place and time. It, it becomes something of the, in, the imagination of all of humanity can relate to. Absolutely. So I think that that's what um, makes things fall apart so spectacularly successful. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we have uh, head of the department of Barampur University, uh, Orissa, Dr. Shruti Dash. I request her to unmute herself and ask you a question personally. Thank you very much, Sharbani. Thank you, Solene. It was a wonderful, wonderful lecture. I congratulate you for such a well-developed lecture. Um, well, Thank you. Uh, may I ask much. you a small question? Yeah, may I ask you a small question, which has been plaguing me for some time? So it, it of course has some connection with your uh, lecture. Well, I, um, well, um, Adishi has made it very clear, in, like why one should be a feminist or whatever, because her characters of female characters are very strong. But you know, don't you think yes. they're like any diaspora women who oscillate between their own country and they and America, so these American diaspora, like you know, the Sri Lankan diaspora there was because of the civil war in Sri Lanka, and also you know, uh, the um, uh, uh, let's say the Sierra Leone diaspora is there because of the civil war. So, same you know, the Nigerian civil war made them um, diaspora or go and study or stay or have a job in America. So, what is that little thing? That makes what is that little thing that makes Adichie different, and what is that special thing about Adichie's female character that we should think about? Because you know, otherwise they are like stereotypes. Like all the diaspora women, you see, all the uh, uh, like you know, forceful women who are struggling for identity away from their own nation, which is plagued by civil war. And they're trying to make a home. They're trying to make a new life for themselves, for their family, going back and forth. So, what is that little thing? I mean, this so, has been. Um, uh, so, are, are you, are you, pro Professor Das? Are you asking? Uh, partly, are you asking why Achebe's books? What? Not Achebe, Adichie. I'm talking about Adichie. I, I, I meant Adichie. I, I beg no, your pardon. No. I meant Adichie. Adichie uh, what yes. makes her books? I'm asking you about Adichie's women. That, yes. You know, her stories, her female characters, they are powerful female characters, but I think that they are stereotypical, like any yeah. writer who has migrated or gone. Uh, to study or get a job or something in a diaspora going back and forth between the native country and America, right? So that's why yeah. I gave you the so, example of so I, Okay, so I, yeah. I, I think I do understand your question and um, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I could understand, I, can under, I could ba basically identify all the reasons that Adichie has such amazing popularity uh again i believe around the world um yeah. because perhaps per, perhaps in 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 some ways she too found an a niche that that a combination of factors put her in the right place at the right time for her reputation to soar 
Uh, of course, those YouTube videos, we should all be feminists and so forth, are very important parts of her image. And I, I know they've had a great impact on me and I've shown them to my students. Yeah, right. but, but I think that uh, primarily, if I'm not correcting, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Das, um, you're, you're, ref you're referring primarily to her most recent novel, which is Americana. Is that right? I'm, I'm referring to all her books where what is that special thing about her? Because, you know, it could be a stereotype. All these diaspora writers, you know, be they from India, be they from Sri Lanka, be they from Sierra Leone or any such country, which has been, uh, I mean, you know, ravaged by civil war, right? So when they migrate to America, yes. when they stay there, so they are struggling for identity and they're making a life for themselves. They're going back and forth into their country and the country of adoption. But what is that little nuanced special thing that makes Adichie's characters or Adichie different? Well, the only characters who really do that in any sustained way in a Chebe, in sorry, in Adichie's work, are the ones in um, the ones in Americana, uh, because the because the main characters in both uh, Purple Hibiscus and uh, Half of a Yellow Sun are in Africa. But Adichie herself uh, corresponds to what you're describing. She herself, uh, it, it, I think, she mainly lives in the United States now uh, and visits Nigeria. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what the balance is, but someone was suggesting at the conference that uh, Sharbani and I attended that she's not in Nigeria much at all anymore, but definitely uh, her characters in, uh, in Americana, I mean, uh, the, the touchstone for success and prestige is to, is to migrate for some period of time, if not forever, to England and especially the United States. Um, and... And, um, but, but, um, I would say that, uh, from having read all of her published fiction, I would say that she has uh, that kind of special quality, which she's able to explore some really co complex and provocative and controversial issues about um, a woman's independence and sexuality and um, national, <laughs> national loyalties and so forth in a way that's quite transparent and bo both complicated and, and transparent that makes her very accessible. Um, but for for me, the, the book that really stands, I mean, I thought both Americana, Americana and Purple Hibiscus are outstanding books. But to me, Half of a Yellow Sun is one of, I really truly believe one of the great masterpieces that I've ever read. Uh, she- Yeah, even I believe that. Oh, good. Okay, got I it. agree. She takes a-, a a family situation and makes you feel invested in their passions, in their tragedies, in a way that that you are almost overcome by its power. Um, I, I don't know how she does it uh, exactly, but I think that th there's something about her characterizations in that novel which achieve a level that is rare um, uh, of um, uh, of creating a powerful narrative and and lifelike details and a sympathetic understanding not only of women but the men in those women's lives. Um, it's sensational. So I think those are the qualities. I, I think that partly her excess might have to do with a certain kind of prestige and marketing uh, and, and, and fame that she's acquired through those videos. But I, I think that she really is a, an, an immensely talented author who's able to, uh, to navigate several different cultural perspectives in the same book. 
right? Thank you. Thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, sorry for the interruption. Uh, we have to begin the session, uh, the second session today. Uh, there's a conversation. So I would request uh, Shujit Malik, Assistant Professor TDB College, uh, to, to host the second session. One minute. Uh, Dr. Basu has not yet joined. I am calling him. So maybe okay, we can. Please. Hmm? Uh, OK, OK. Uh -huh. It's not a problem. Uh, let Shujit uh, introduce the thing. Uh, just to uh, hold on a bit. Uh, so uh, next, I mean, today is the last day of our uh, international lecture series. So we will call it as a finale day. Uh, the last person will be. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I don't know. Dr. Kunal Roj. So I am going to introduce him uh, before the party. Uh, Dr. Shujit. Please wait for him to enter one minute. Okay, okay. Uh, Shobhan, uh, Dr. Basu has uh, already joined. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Yes. 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 Uh, very warm welcome, Dr. Basu. Okay, I now request Shujit to please uh, start the introduction. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Kunal Basu. His name is sufficient for all. But still, it is customary to introduce you before the panel. A little louder, a little louder. Uh, okay. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Yes, audible. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, okay. yes, yes. You are audible. Okay. Uh, the name, uh, Dr. Kunal Basu, Kunal Basu is uh, quite familiar. Uh, but still, it is uh, customary uh, for us to introduce because the all participants of this international web lecture series. Konal Basu uh, uh, needs no introduction still. Uh, is one of the most prolific and popular novelists. He's a bilingual novelist. After Ramkin Chandra Chattopadhyay, he's the only Bengali writer and novelist who writes in both languages, Bengali and in English. He was born in Kolkata. Sunil Kumar Basu, renowned publisher, and Shobhi Basu, a uh, uh, renowned writer. He was brought on books and enriched in conversation at home that was visited by galaxy of prominent men and women of the day. He studied mechanical engineering at Jadavpur University. Following his doctoral program for degree, he was a professor at McGill University, Montreal, Canada, from 1986 to 1998. His 13 years at McGill University were interrupted by a, a brief stint at Indian Institute of Management, Kolkata, in 1989. Since 1999, he has been teaching at Oxford University site business school. Basu is one of the very few Indian practitioners of historical fiction. He published, he published novels are as follows. The Opium Class, published in 2001. The Military, published in 2003. Versus, 2006. The Yellow Emperor Q, 2011. Calcutta, 2015, last in his novel, that is, Origin is Mother, published in 2020. Our story collection that he wrote, uh, Japan is Why, quite uh, popular and well known as uh, one of our renowned directors, opponents, and uh, made a film on, on that story. It was published in 2008, and his Bengali novels are. Robi Shankar, 2016, which was published in 2016. Pirate Dorja, 2017. Tejostini O. Sopnam, 2008. So, uh, uh, as I 
already mentioned, this is the last day of our lecture series, and Dr. Bals is the bright star at the start of our finale. Now over to Dr. Sarvani Banerjee, the first floor of NARC, to proceed the whole affair, and I mean, I request the bus in NARC to this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Sujit. Kunal, a very warm welcome to you. So we are running a little behind schedule just now. Uh, we will now start our questions straight away. May I also introduce to you my fellow uh, compatriot, Dr. Shorab Nag. He is head of the department of Onda Thana Mahapitalai, a very young and promising scholar. And it, he appears to be smitten by you, completely smitten. And uh, he practically went on repeating that we, you must invite him, otherwise this lecture is not happening. So uh, thank you so much for making our time. We will now begin with our um, questions to you. We will be asking you a series of questions. And we will be waiting for all that you have to say to us about that. Now, uh, I would like to begin right at the beginning. Because uh, you come from a very, very illustrious family of Kolkata, North Kolkata. In fact, a street in Kolkata is named after your forefather. Um, and also that you were born in a family where your mother, uh, respected Shobi Boshu, was a writer, and your father, uh, respected Shunil Kumar Boshu, was a publisher. Now, did this ambience of writing and publishing and a house full of books, did this influence you to become a writer? Uh, Dr. Basu, please unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Basu, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Can you hear yes. me now? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's getting a bit late. In yes. my other life, I'm a professor. And I think you know that professors don't like to be kept waiting. <laughs> um, regardless, I'm sure as our conversation goes forward, my moods will improve. Uh, yeah, I was born in a house full of books. My favorite scent in this world is the scent of paper. And my favorite sight is the sight of bookshelves. So much so that I've told my wife, Shishmita, that if I were to fall sick and die in a hospital, then she would please get hold of a stack of books and place them in front of me. So my last sight on this planet could be that of books. Uh, be that as it may, um, I have to be honest in saying that when I was growing up in this house of books, my ambition was not to be a writer. I did not see myself on the shelves. Uh, neither did I see myself as one of the authors, one of the many authors who came to our house and had ruckus conversation with my parents on a whole host of topics. I actually wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be an actor. But such are the twists and turns of life that I didn't end up being either of them and ended up being an author. So a short answer to your question, Shorbani, is uh, Yes, uh, a very early initiation into books, but no specific ambition to be a writer when I started out. Obviously, I was fascinated by books. Um, I, I oftentimes say that as a son of a publisher, I don't have blood in my veins, but I have ink in my veins. Wow. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a, a personal question for you. Uh, share with us some of your unforgettable childhood memories that you want to share with us. Some unforgettable childhood memories oh, that is <laughs> that so is stuck in your mind. I no no that is a yes that is that is a huge uh, broad question. I would just uh, request you maybe that you would tell us the story of uh, of how you ended up in Rinalshan's movie as a very young boy. Oh, that one. Um, I was about five or six, I think, and um, yes. uh, along with my friends, we were playing cricket in front of our house uh, in, in South Kolkata. 
Uh, actually, I wasn't playing. I, I was uh, standing by the side of the street and I was uh, giving commentary. I was describing the match. I was giving commentary. And you know, I, I loved uh, cricket commentary. Uh, actually, my spoken English came from listening to English commentary, cricket commentary on the radio. Um, I was a very sickly child and spent a lot of my time when I was young on, in bed. And I would listen to cricket commentary on radio. And um, that actually got me hooked into English, uh, for better or for worse. Um, now, as I was standing and you know, sort of giving commentary uh, of the match, there was this uh, gentleman, tall, wiry gentleman on the other side of the street, uh, who was watching me closely. And he came over and he said, what's your name? Uh, and then uh, asked me where I lived. And then he said, well, I want to go to your house. I was taken aback, uh, but I went along with him. He went to our house. And of course, my parents were very uh, were delighted to see Mrinal Sen, who was one of their uh, close friends. And he said, how come you've dropped in? Uh, he said, no, no, I've not come to have a chat with you but I've come to talk over a few things with the actor of my next film. <laughs> so, so he asked my parents if uh, they would agree to me uh, being a child actor for, one of, for, for a film, for, for his forthcoming film, uh, Punoscho, which I acted in. Uh, and then I, then I did another one, then a few more. And then my mother, uh, she cut short my acting career. Uh, she cut it short because, as I mentioned, I was, was quite sick. And... Uh, the, 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 the film studios uh, uh, in, in Taliganj are not the most hygienic of places. You know, they're dark, they're damp, uh, they're dusty, uh, and I had respiratory illnesses. And so my mother said, no, I mean, enough is enough. And she cut short my acting career. But that's how I got started. I just want to share with the audience that uh, uh, Kunal has a wonderful website very recently freshly designed and i would implore i request you all to visit it to have a better idea of the man himself and how multifaceted he is now uh, kunal in your website it is described describes you as an author uh, an artist an actor and an academician now i would ask you among these four which role is closest to your heart and how would you rank them as far as you are concerned oh i mean, I mean, I mean writing is my thing i mean author of course um that's what i do um i get up in the morning uh and uh to get to my desk and begin writing uh, when i go to sleep i think of uh, the uh, stuff that i've written that day um when I, when I work out in the gym in the afternoon, which I absolutely hate to do, um, I think about my writing, that it makes my, my exercise more pleasurable. Um, and so uh, I'm forever thinking about my writing and, and, and books and you know, reading up for my books, going places for my books. So I'm questioning, uh, is, is my, my authorship, uh, which, is, uh, which is most important. But I find myself coming back to art in recent years. Uh, and uh, I do my artwork, but mostly when I'm between books. Uh, you know, uh, I don't have a pastime. I don't have a hobby, as it were. So art is not my hobby. It is a serious pursuit, but it must make space for writing, which is my major pursuit. Um, acting, I mean, you've seen my white hair. I mean, I don't think any director would be bold enough to cast me now. Uh, you so never know. You never know. <laughs> yes, but, sir. Uh, one thing I must say, sir, you have a very photogenic face. You have a very striking presence. And now, you, you, my, my mood is already beginning to improve, I can tell you. <laughs> okay. I, can, I can understand by the sparkle in your eyes. It has come back. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and academics, yeah, I mean, I've been an academic for 30, 37, 38 years now. Uh, and um, I, I hope I've been diligent in what I do. I hope I've been responsible to my students and my academic colleagues. Um, but it has never been. Uh, I'm an accidental academic. It has never been my first love. I wish it was, but it wasn't. Um, and, uh, but it's a vocation which I've carried on my shoulders uh, for a number of years. And as now the weight has become a lot lighter. Um, and uh, you know, I actually, for the past many years, is writing is what I do, and writing my fiction is what I do.
uh, okay so thank you very much uh, my next question uh, is again a broad one and this is uh, sir what other dimensions of life that actually i was listening to some of your interviews and conversations on youtube and there i found that you have uh, talked about uh, how how books have influenced you uh, and and i was also listening to uh, the kolkata literary meet uh, video where you have uh, spoken on the nakshalwadi thing how people uh, were selfless how the world view was different uh, my question is sir uh, what other dimensions of life influence you as a writer apart from the literary ones mm. is there anything that influences you uh, in particular how do you derive those because uh, uh, from our childhood we have been uh, convinced by the romantic uh, poets and writers that uh, creative writing is something uh, that is not possible without inspiration okay so uh, my question is what other dimensions of life inspire you could you please share with us you know hard question but broadly speaking i think it is quest um it is quest for um uh aspects of hum of the human condition that i'm unfamiliar with you see i'm a novelty seeker i have the wonder of a child and what i seek is to discover for myself aspects of the human condition um that are hitherto unknown to me um you know in writing schools one is taught to write what one knows the first maxim that one hears in a writing uh, program in a creative writing program is write what you know okay very very fortunately i never went to a creative writing program and uh, i'm excited by what i don't know i'm fascinated by the unfamiliar by the strange and and this unfamiliarity is not simply with respect to place it could be about place it could be about times it could be about uh personalities human beings discovering aspects of life which uh opens would open up a completely new world for me um and if you if you if you followed my writing at all you would see yes, yes. Uh, that uh, that sort of manifests itself in, in in different ways i mean the yellow emperor is cure um the search is uh both both literal and metaphorical So the Portuguese doctor travels to China in the 19th century to find a cure for syphilis. Okay? Because he believes that western canons of medicine and Chinese canons of medicine are very different. Okay? And maybe there's something to be learned there. So he has a liter up uh, a very uh, explicit object of search. But at the same time there's a search within. There's a search within civilizations, the civilization that he represents for an answer. about health and well-being and the human condition that goes way beyond europe okay. um in in other in other novels as well i mean in the miniaturist uh, i think uh the the quest that behzad the young uh, genius um is confronted with is to search for a meaning the real value of art in life what is art uh, useful for is it at all useful is it useful to the individual is it individual is it in important only to build careers artistic careers what value does it provide uh to help human well being uh, and so in in many ways i mean I, i can i can go on but you can see that in in most of my writing uh the 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 engine the psychological engine the inspiration as you, as you mentioned uh is derived from a quest and in this i the author is as much the seeker as the characters in my novels this uh discussion brings me directly to what i want uh, to know in my next question because is not only that you, you began writing around 2000 in the year 2000 and you have uh, you are a prolific writer and one book after the other that have come out every novel have you know different geographical and historical backgrounds i mean how do you travel across landscapes and centuries with so much ease you are at one point in china you are going to uh, akbar's mughal india you are traveling to racist africa i mean uh, the 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 your landscape is mm, uh, as as open as the universe 
So how do you do that and how much research do you uh, need to apply? Well, actually, my first um, short story came out in London Magazine in 1997. Um, it was called Lenin's Cafe. Uh, and the first published book was, the uh, first novel was 2001. 2001. Um, um, I travel, my, my, my stories determine my locus of travel. Um, I, I must have chemical imbalance in my brain because I think of all these stories and most of these stories are set, uh, these stories are set in different parts of the world, in different cultural contexts, geographical uh, uh, regions, in, in different time spaces. Uh, why I think about these stories, I do not have a good answer. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, when I think of a story and the story uh, grabs my attention, begs to be written, uh, then I begin my methodology. And my methodology is, has really two parts. One is, A, I begin educating myself about the world, the context, that my characters will inhabit and my story will play itself out. See, being an academic in my other life, uh, you know, helps because I, I understand the process of research. And most importantly, I know when to end research. I know when to stop research. Okay. Because as much as research is important, it's important to terminate research. Otherwise, the, the faculties of imagination will not stay cold. Uh, and the second aspect, uh, which, uh, which, which, which supports and which helps uh, my writing in different parts of the world, is to really develop uh, an empathy and a strong connection with the characters themselves. See, if I did not feel for Antonio Maria, who is a Portuguese doctor, a young Portuguese doctor, okay, who bears no demographic similarities to me, none whatsoever, but if I did not have a strong connection with this person, I would not be able to write this, write this novel, no matter how much research I did. Okay. So the two important aspects for me when I travel with my novels and stories to different parts of the world in different times is, do I see myself in these characters? Can I, can I feel for them? Can I, will, will, I, will I stay up at night for them? And if so, can I fertilize my imagination doing the necessary research to bring the story to light? Okay. So I'm just going to say one, one quick thing here. I was doing a, a live television interview with PBS, which is uh, a network in America, public broadcasting system um, called Literati. And the, and the gentleman who was interviewing me, a razor sharp interviewer, and uh, he said, um, Mr. Basu, you have written a novel about opium but you're not Chinese, evidently. Yeah, you've written a Mughal novel, but you're not a Muslim. Um, and you've written a novel about racial science in Victorian England, and you're not even white. So do you own this world? <laughs> now, this, this was a, a you know, he, he, he put me on a, in a spot. Um, and uh, although it was, it seems like a flippant question, it was not really a flippant question. Because what he was really asking is, where lies the root of your creative imagination? Or do you have a root? Uh, you know, does your creative imagination have a root? And um, my response to him, uh, again, sounded quite flippant, but I believed in those words. So I'm going to repeat them here. I said, yes, I, own, I do own this world. I own this world by my imagination. If I can imagine a story, I can write it. And it does not matter. If, I'm, if, if it stretches me outside of my skin, as it has in many instances. Thank you, uh, thank, thank you Dr. Basu. Uh, in, in a Joypur literary meet, there was an interview, and uh, you, you said that uh, Bankim Chandra Chattapadha uh, is your muse. So if you, uh, if you look at uh, Bankim uh, in this way as your muse, how will you look at Tagore? Because I think that uh, without any discussion on Tagore, uh, no conversation among uh, the Bengalis uh, can be complete. So how will you look at Tagore in 2020? Well, Bunkim is not my muse, really, but I do see him as a complete novelist in some sense. Right? Okay. He's a complete novelist because um, 
uh, he was inspired by Scott. Um, uh, but his, his uh, execution of plot, uh, depiction of characters, uh, interplay of themes, uh, and uh, you know, d down to the details of dialogue uh, and scene setting are impeccable. And in that sense, um, uh, although my writing is very different from 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 Boom Kim's, uh, I do uh, draw inspiration from him in terms of bringing an, a whole writing or a narrative project together. Uh, Tagore is indispensable. It is indis he's indispensable because he is, in my view, the most cosmopolitan author India has ever produced. Okay, and I say those words with caution. Because although most of, I think all of uh, Tagore's fictional works, prose fiction, are located in, uh, in Bengal, most of them in Bengal, certainly all of them in India, he, his, uh, his writing has a whiff of the world. Okay. In reading Tagore's novels, you sense the temper of the times. You sense the key forces at play in this world and which touch on the shores of Bengal. Okay. He was as much a Bengali author as an Indian author as a global author. And remembering Tagore is especially important today, given the state of Bengali fiction today that we, that we have today, which is provincial, which is introverted, which ignores the world, which even ignores India, the rest of India. Okay, so Tagore is particularly poignant because his fiction bloomed on so in the soil of Bengal, but it drew its sustenance, both philosophically and in terms of the different thematics uh, from the from the entire unit from from the, from the rest of the world. Um, and so, so to your, uh, your answer to your question, Shorab is uh, he is immensely. Um, He's immensely uh, influential. I do remember, I mean, you, you brought up uh, no discussion is complete without, without Jovindranath. I remember when the Japanese wife came out, my collection of short stories came out, which you may or may not have read. Um, one of the reviewers, uh, I think it was the Hindu, who wrote um, about this story called The Japanese Wife, it's worthy of a Tagore. Wow. And, and, and it, and it, and it, and I, it aggravated me because nothing is worthy of Tagore. Thank you so much. Uh, that is indeed, uh, you know, that is, these are the nuances behind a writer's mind that we are all, and if you can read the messages that are coming down, everybody is congratulating me for having this opportunity to listen to you. They are all getting more and more inspired. Um, you once said to me in an interview where I was taking your interview that you, when you are writing a particular novel, you subconsciously live the life of those characters. I mean, uh, could you share with us how you did that? I, uh, especially, I remember that one about the miniaturist. How you said you, re you ate a lot of Mughlai Khana and you got really fat. I mean, I cannot imagine you as fat, though. I have never seen you fat. <laughs> but uh, I mean, how do you live your life when you are writing these novels? You know, this comes from my background in acting. So uh, I had a brief career uh, on the stage uh, here as well as in Montreal, in, in, in Canada, on the English language stage. But here in, in Kolkata, uh, I was a part of the People's Little Theatre, PLT, uh, which you would know from the name of Paul um, and in a uh, we were all familiar when we were growing up with the Stanislavski method of acting. And the Stanislavski method of acting was you, know, you, you have to put yourself in character. It's not simply being on stage as a character, but while you're rehearsing for the play, while you're acting the play, and, and during that whole period of time, you are that character. Okay? And Utpal Dato really insisted on that. Okay? And, uh, and so we would uh, you know, go through elaborate, you know, sort of mental rehearsals uh, to become that person. Um, and I, I, I do remember I was acting in a play for PLT and I became a character which really aggravated my girlfriend, you know, and she said, how come you're like, you're not like this? How come you've become like this? What's wrong with you? you know? 
And I was at a very hard time convincing her, look, I'm in character. I'm not Kunal, I'm in character. Okay. <laughs> so I think uh, it comes from my Stanislavski uh, experience. Um, look, uh, for a practicing uh, novelist, you know, not a literary theorist, but for a practicing novelist, what I'm trying to do is weave uh, um, a web of uh, a web of lies, which are which are believable to you, the reader. In, in in for that to be believable, I must believe in the lie myself. Okay, and I have to create a kind a vestige of life, whereby for a for a period of time I I, I begin to resemble those characters in some way or the other. Now some of these challenges are more difficult than others. I mean. Becoming a, a, a Mughal painter in 16th century uh, in, uh, India is incredibly hard. I mean, this man grew up in a fortress town. I didn't. Um, this, uh, this man um, uh, spent, uh, you know, had access into the Mughal harem. Uh, I don't even know what a Mughal harem looks like or looked like. Okay. So all of this, um, uh, so one approximates. And the way I approximated for the, the, for the miniaturist was, well, if you can't live like a mogul, at least eat like one. <laughs> uh, li li listen to Hindustani classical music, um, uh, you know, and sort of, uh, and, and travel. So I re-travel extensively in Mughal India uh, through, uh, you know, uh, India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, up to uh, Eastern, Eastern Turkey, where my novel ends in Cappadocia. So all of that, in, in some ways, internally, psychologically, created the illusion that I was living in those times and I knew these characters well. Okay. And that's the, that's the method which, which, which works for me. Now, you know, it's difficult to do in some situations, so I have to find clever stratagem uh, in order to sort of make this fit. Wonderful. Yes, I also remember you told me about how you were walking the streets in Calcutta, especially the Sada Street area, and just before you were writing Calcutta, your novel, and how yeah. you gradually befriended yeah. those characters. And that was so difficult. I mean, none of us knew that such a Calcutta really uh, uh, was alive and bubbling behind the, you know, the, the, the clear veneer. Thank you so much. Chora? Your question now? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. My my next question is actually related to creative writing. Uh, we I, we know that creative writing is something uh, that that probably uh, that cannot be taught, that cannot be learned in this way. You can learn the method, you can teach the method, but the thing that spark that comes from within can never be learned. Uh, I I I request you. Uh, to to give certain advices to the aspiring writers, the budding writers, or those who want to write. Oh, this is difficult, you know, because um, look, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've never been to a creative writing department uh, uh, program myself. Yes, sir. Um, but as part of uh, part of book tours in different countries and different cities. Sometimes we are asked as authors to go and talk to students of creative writing departments, particularly in America, which has uh, American university, the many American universities of creative writing departments. Okay. And uh, you know, your sponsors, you don't want to upset your sponsors. So I've gone and given talks in creative writing departments as well. Now I, I provide very little advice and all I say, I say basically there are three things that I talk about. The first thing I talk about is the, uh, to read as widely and as broadly as possible. Okay. By doing so, one recognizes what one likes and what one doesn't like. Okay. Look, all of literature is not exciting to an individual. It cannot be. Okay. So there may be some great writers who I absolutely dislike or I sort of like, but no, I wouldn't go back to them. And there are others that I would go back to again and again and again. Okay. So by reading widely, you, you, you narrow the field. You know what you like and you know what you don't like. Okay. The second thing is, is, to, is to write copiously and to write regularly. Okay. Because and if you do that, uh, or, the, the, or an inspiring writer does that, then 
over a period of time, not instantly, but over a period of time, you realize you hear your own voice in your ear. You hear your own voice in your ear. Okay. And you know, yes, this is me speaking. This is me writing. Okay. And, and the third thing is, um, and, I've, and I've gotten into some trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that, you know, it's good to be a bit arrogant. Okay. Not very arrogant, but it's good to be a bit arrogant. And, I'm, and the reason I say this is, at the end of the day, it's your voice, your words, that you're presenting to readers, that you would like to present to readers. Okay. If you are overly concerned about literary criticism of what others are saying, or, or what everybody else is saying, or what others are writing about, then you have people standing behind your shoulders and advising you. Okay. So it's very important to say, this is what I hear in my ears. This has been my passage through life. This is my recognition of my essential truths. And this is how I'm going to write about them. If you like them, great. If you don't like them, I can't help you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Somebody's just asked me whether I have any plans for writing plays. Um, no, no plans yet, but you know, never say never. So I, I might just end up writing a play. Uh, I've written a play in Bengali years and years and years back when I was in university, but not one in English. But you know, who knows? Uh, Shorbari Di, uh, please unmute yourself. Shorbari Di, unmute yourself. Yes. Um, sorry. Uh, I, uh, there are stories, interesting stories of how a certain plot has, you know, suddenly unraveled to you in an epiphanic moment. I particularly remember of how the story of the Yellow Emperor's Cure came to you. I think when you were visiting some friend, some, uh, I mean, how does suddenly, or you are in a snowstorm in Canada and the plot of Japanese wife suddenly comes to, I mean, could you uh, share with us those, uh, of one or two of those, I, I would like to, as a, as a teacher of literature, I would like to call it an epiphanic moment. Yeah, you know, um, again, uh, these are, these are, these are um, difficult questions to answer, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the writing method is a more conscious method. Yeah. You know what you want to do and how you want to do it. Um, and even if you want to make a departure of your method, you know what you're departing from and where you, you're ending up. Um, the more tr tricky question is, why did you think of this story in the first place? Or how did you think of this story uh, uh, um, when, when you, how did this story appear in your mind? Um, it is difficult to put a finger on that. Now, there's some stories where I can be more explicit and say, that was the moment when I thought about it. Okay? And I'm going to give you an example of that. But take Racist, for example, my third novel. You know, for the life of me, I don't know why I thought or when I thought of this hideous experiment involving a white child and a black child to unravel the mystery of human variation or the, the difference between the races conducted by two European scientists in a deserted island off the coast of Africa. Why on earth did I think of that? I do not have a cogent explanation in my mind. Okay. Um, but the Yale Emperor's Cure there is a very, um, very explicit pathway in my mind, which I can go back to and which I can trace. And I can say that that's when I thought of the story. And it came about, and I'll tell you briefly, I'd gone to Beijing for, a, uh, for an academic event. This was not my literary life. This was my academic life. And I've been to China many, many times, over a dozen times for academic reasons. Also for literary reasons later. I read at the Beijing Literary Festival and the Shanghai Literary Festival. Uh, but on that trip, which was an academic trip, uh, one of my Chinese ex-students um, uh, invited me for lunch. Okay? Um, and she was the director of the School of Public Health attached to the largest university for traditional Chinese medicine in the world. Okay? Uh, and I almost said no, because uh, you know, I, I don't have a taste for formality. You know, and uh, I feel bored by these events. Uh, you know, 
the typical banquet dinner, pleasantries exchanged, uh, and all of that. I mean, I've done it many times. I almost said no. But there was a small voice in the back of my head which said, now look, Kunal, um, she's your student. She's invited you. So why don't you just go? Okay. Don't disappoint her. Go. So I did. And it turned out to be a very boring lunch. At the end of the lunch, at the hospital, at this uh, huge uh, building, uh, the, they said, well, do, would you like to see the, medicine, the Museum for Traditional Chinese Medicine, which is upstairs? And I love museums. And I said, OK. And they took me up. Uh, and uh, they, this was a huge museum. There was nobody else there except me. And they left me there, and they disappeared. So I started walking around the exhibit in the glass cases. And the exhibits were of the, all the ingredients of traditional Chinese medicine, like the liver of a horse or some kind of a mushroom, you know, or all these different kinds of um, you know, ingredients and stuff. And as I was walking, I was thinking, um, you know, I'm a 21st century citizen, and I know about Chinese medicine. We can buy Chinese medicine in shops in Britain and things like that. Um, why am I so surprised? Why is this striking me as really very odd, very remarkable? And then I said, well, if I am so struck by it, think of what a 19th century European, how they would react to an exhibit like this. And I was walking around. I said, well, why would a 19th century European be here in the first place? Well, maybe the person was a doctor and had an interest in this subject. All right, makes sense. Now, why would a European doctor be interested in looking at exhibits for Chinese traditional medicine? Of course, at that, in the 19th century, the Europeans thought that they were the masters of the universe, that they knew everything and nobody knew and nobody else knew anything at all. Okay, they were the, the rest were savages. Now, what if the doctor was looking for the cure of a disease for which there was no cure in the West? Possible? Now, what disease would that be? Now, I mean, is this all this is going on in my mind as I'm walking around the exhibits, okay? Oh, that disease would be syphilis, wouldn't it? Because that was a killer disease. For 400 years, it ravaged the West, and there was no cure for it. Okay? So what if an European doctor has come to... Can you, can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. yes. I, yes seem to, I seem to have lost network connection, but can you see me? We can all see you and hear you. OK, very good. So um, what if there was, a story, uh, there was a story about a European doctor traveling to China in the 19th century to find a cure for syphilis? And I got excited about that plot. And I dashed back in a taxi to my hotel, canceled all other appointments for the day, and started uh, writing down the plot of that uh, Uh, his connection seems, seems to have been lost. Uh, I will just call him. Please bear with us for two minutes. And I request here at this moment that we have got a break to all of us. Please do not leave now. We just have about a few more minutes left. It doesn't look nice when such an eminent author is speaking and people are leaving. We still have some time for dinner, all of us. Please bear with us for just maybe about 15 or 20 minutes and we will wind up. Thank you. OK. OK. All right, can you hear and see me now? Yes, yes, yes sir. Yes. OK, great. So did you get the end of the story? Yes, we, we got to the park, and you said that you rushed back and canceled all your And, your and uh, I, I sort of scribbled it down in a, in a pad. And that was the genesis of the Yellow Emperor's Cure. And of course, then I said, well, what do I know about syphilis? Nothing. Uh, what do I know about? Uh, you know, uh, about Portugal, 
somehow I wanted him to be Portuguese, the doctor to be Portuguese, and there's some reasons for that. So I started researching uh, medical history of med medicine, 19th century uh, Lisbon, uh, medical training in Lisbon, and all of that. And then it took me two years to write that novel. Wonderful. I still remember how, and, and a huge amount of research into the, the Chinese milieu also of 19th century. Yes. yes. Uh, that, that was simply huge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Sharmani, uh, is there any question from the audience? There are lots of questions. Yeah, okay, he okay. has already answered the question put to him by One Nilanda. question, yes. Uh, she said uh, she had asked about uh, a place. Uh, there are some other questions. Yes, there is a question by Boyjanta okay. Mukherjee. Uh, the uh, question no, is... Uh, excuse me, just before that, uh, Omrit that... oh. has asked, Sir, what is your all-time favorite book that you mm -hmm. would love to read anytime, anywhere in your life? Oh, gosh, that's a very, very hard question to answer. Very hard question, yes. And I would, we would question. all like to know. The world yeah, wants to know. You know, for, uh, you know uh, I never read when I'm traveling. It's a very peculiar thing. I mean, for example, a lot of people read when they're on a flight. And I fly all the time. I must fly about uh, 100,000 miles a year. Yes. Uh, but uh, so I'm always waiting in airports uh, and you know, getting on planes and things like that. And I can never read when I'm flying or when I'm traveling. Okay? So um, I, I read. And for the last many years, my reading has become quite stunted because I read for my writing. And that's an awful thing to say. Uh, but because uh, I, I have been somewhat prolific, I've written quite a few books in the past many years, and I've researched many of these novels, I'm forever reading stuff to, to help me write my novel. And so I haven't read, um, uh, but you know, to answer your question, there are some favorite books that I, that, I, that I go back to from time to time, either to amuse me, myself, uh, or to uh, sort of uh, draw sustenance from them in some way or the other. Um, you know, there's a, there's a novel that I, I, I'm sometimes, uh, some time back, a, a journalist asked me that if you could write one novel and die, what novel would that be? Uh, and I said, it's clearly Animal Farm. Okay. Wow. Uh, 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 because I have a real excitement for fables, you know. Uh, and again, uh, if you think about it, I started writing historical. I've written four novels that are historical novels. So on the one end of the literary spectr spectrum, you've got historical fiction, which is very detailed, which is very factually bound in time and place. And on the other extreme, you have a fable, which is completely unbound in terms of time and space. It could happen anywhere. Right? The animal farm could happen in Bengal. Yes. Okay. So although I, I, if, even when I was writing historical novels, I was fascinated by fables. And I, and I snuck in fables. So if you remember my first novel, The Opium Clark, uh, Hiranagar Chakravarti, my protagonist, interprets the complex realities of life around him by remembering the fables of Panchotantra, which he had learned in the tone, in the Sanskrit tone. So the fables provide him with guidance in interpreting complex characters and complex scenarios. Okay? So I'm really drawn to fables. And I felt, feel that the simplicity and the complexity of Animal Farm is so timeless that if I could ever write something like that, okay, then I would have hit the high point of my writing life. Uh, Dr. Shushant Kumar Bordhan, he's a fellow professor of English like us, he asks a very interesting question, which we have, I think I have never, none of us have asked you. Sir, how does the sad moments of a creative writer impact his or her writing? Oh, okay. Now, now, so if you, if you read Sigmund Freud, uh, Freud, uh, when he was writing about creativity, said that the spot of creativity happens when somebody is at a psychological or emotional low. Okay. And it, that spot of creativity tends to taper off when the mood enhances, when one is feeling exuberant. It doesn't disappear 
but sort of plateaus. So uh, sadness or uh, despondence, despondence is probably for me a, a, a more accurate depiction of the mood state I sometimes find myself in is, is quite frequent in a writer's life. Despondence for a whole variety of reasons. Some that are real, some that are imagined. Okay. But the despondence in many ways uh, really helps to uh, sort of focus on, on helps me uh, to focus on writing. Um, you know, there are moments in my professional life which are not particularly exciting to me. Professional life as a business edu professor, business educator. Okay, and uh, when I come back from uh, uh, from uh, 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 you know from college, uh, sometimes I feel that you know, oh gosh, I'm wasting my life. Why am I doing this? Okay, and in those moments of darkness or those moments of despondence, I think I've written some of my better lines, some of my better pieces or parts. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. A student asks, sir, with due respect, I would like to ask you, is there a language other than Bengali and English that you would like to maybe write in at some point, point in the future? A language uh, that probably fascinates you? See, you have raised our expectations. You're no, right. I would love to, I would love to, love, sadly, I do not have that much time left in my life uh, to, uh, to learn and master uh, in a literary sense, a language uh, whereby I could aim to be a practitioner there, you know. Uh, but uh, I wish I could write in Urdu. Uh, I wish I could write in uh, French. I wish I could write in Sanskrit. There's so many languages in the world, you know. Um, when I listen to uh, my friend um, um, uh, Hanan Ashrawi uh, speak in Arabic, um, it's so it's so mellifluous, uh, and I wish I knew Arabic to be able to write. Okay, and so there's so many languages that I would love to uh, uh, love to have known, love to have written in, uh, but you know, a human life is circumscribed by many factors, and I'm and I believe those factors are closing in on me. Uh, thank uh, you, sir. Why uh, are we uh, responding to you? <laughs> You're talking about death too much, and I don't like it. <laughs> uh, the, ne the next question is asked by uh, Bojanta Mukherjee, and that is uh, the last question we shall take today. Sir, it's an honor to hear you speak today. As a student of art and literature, I feel compelled to ask you, what is more important in an artist's life, validation or recognition from critics and public, or the absolute freedom of art and expression without the least bit of concern paid towards opinions? Okay, um, so let me tell you a story. So my first novel had just been commissioned by Weidenfeld and Nicholson, which is a very major literary publisher in the United Kingdom. And as a, so I was going out with my commissioning editor, Maggie McCurden, uh, for the first of many lunches okay, in Soho in London. And Maggie is a one, was a wonderful editor. She had, into, uh, she had edited... Um, Michael Ondaje, Vikram Seth, Ben Okri, uh, and we were having a, our first lunch. And we, and we sat down. First of all, I couldn't understand a word of what she said because she's a Scot, you see. And my ears were not tuned into, into Scottish uh, uh, English. And I kept saying, pardon me? Could you say that again? It was very embarrassing. It was very embarrassing. Okay. But anyways, as we got into our lunch, she said, uh, after a few uh, nibbles, she said, so Kunal, uh, what would you like to be? What would you like to have? Would you like to have great critical recognition? Or would you like to be a real popular writer, which, which everybody would want to read, regardless of critical recognition? Okay. Uh, and um, I was well into my main course, and I said, look, Maggie, I'm a greedy Bengali boy. I will eat everything that is served to me. So I'll have both. <laughs> you know, I will finish the plate which is in front of me. So I'll have both. I would want authors love to be loved. We love to be loved. Okay? And we love to be loved by everybody, by critics, as well as those who are just reading for pleasure. Okay? So why would I want 
an artificial line to be drawn and said, I only want the academy to be excited about me. And who cares if nobody else ever goes to a bookshop and picks up a copy of my book? You know, what is most gratifying? You know, what is most gratifying to an author? So again, after my first novel, The Opium Clark, came out, I was taking the train from London, from Oxford to London. It was a short ride, 55 minutes. Uh, people ask me, what is your favorite train journey? I said, the two favorite train journeys in the world, two absolute favorite train journeys in the world. One is Kolkata to Bolpur, which is number one in my estimation. Kolkata to Bolpur for Shantini Ketan. And the second is Oxford to London or from London to Oxford, coming home in the evening. Okay. And as I got on the train, this was a week after my novel had come out, a week. And I think just one review of the had come out of the Times Literary Supplement. And I saw a middle-aged lady come in, sit down in front of me. And uh, when the train started, she took out my novel from her bag and started reading it. <laughs> and those 55 moments, uh, I went through 55 shades of emotions. Okay. On the one hand, I wanted to get up and say, well, are you liking the novel? Is it good? Um, you know, what do you think? Which page are you on? What part of the story are you reading? Okay, but I couldn't obviously I was timid. I was shy. I couldn't do that. You know, I wish you would turn that page over and on the back flap see the photograph look across me and say ah, you are the author, but she didn't do that. Okay, and at many moments I came close to sort of breaking the ice, but then when the train pulled into Paddington station in, in London, she just put the book in, in, into her bag and she walked off the train. And that, um, and I've left to rue for the rest of my life, what did she make of the opium track? Okay. So that's what we, that's what I as an author want. Uh, I want uh, serious scholars like yourself, academics like yourselves, to delve into uh, uh, my writing and, uh, and say things that maybe I haven't seen myself. And I, at the same time, would want people just going to a bookshop, pick up my novel or a book, sit down with a cup of coffee and read it. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful anecdote. Thank you very much. Had we time, these anecdotes could have gone on and on forever. Yes. Uh, one, one student asked, uh, 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 she's a professor now. She sent this question. This, uh, I think, should be our last question today. She sent this over WhatsApp. She wants to ask you, what does uh, uh, he consider his, what do, what do you rather consider your worst and best qualities as a writer? Goodness. What? I wouldn't have the guts to ask this question. She's very brave. <laughs> what worst qualities? I only have great qualities. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so, you, know, you know, there's nothing. There's nothing called best or worst. There's some things that I'm reasonably happy about, and there's some things that I would want to do better. Okay, um, if I, I I feel that my my best book is in front of me, not behind me. Okay, right. Um, I, I don't think that I've written the book which would please me immensely yet. Yeah. So in order for me to do that, what is it that I need to do? So this is trying to answer that question in a slightly roundabout way, but hopefully really answering the question is, I would like to be an even keener observer of human nature. Because that's what authors do. That's what great authors do. So when we read Dostoevsky, and if you read notes from the underground, you see what a keen observer of, the, of human nature he was. Okay. So I hopefully will develop faculties in order to observe human nature in even more minute detail so that I can write better, so I can manifest that better. Okay. So, and what is it that I do reasonably well? You know what I do reasonably well? My commitment to writing. You know, this is what I live for. I always tell people, again, going back to creative writing students or, or uh, people who would want to write, is if you can live a life without writing, don't write. Don't write. Okay. 
because writing will bring its fair share of sadness, despondence, disappointment. But if you cannot lead a life without writing, then you have to write. Okay. And I certainly cannot lead a life without writing. And so I think that's what that's the quality I bring to my writing. But there are many other qualities that I need to cultivate in order to become the writer that I wish to become. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think Shorbani, we, uh, we should uh, we should go to the last session of our uh, webinar. There are some certain yes, important uh, declarations, but before that, uh, I would like we... to ask. Uh, I would like to yes, ask. Uh, okay, 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 uh, fine. Kunal Basu. I would like to ask Kunal Basu, uh, which uh, he has um, created many char characters. So, which is his favorite character, and uh, does he think that that character has a bit of Kunal Basu in the in him? Oh, yeah, wow. very good question. You know, um, generally speaking, I've not been very autobiographical. Yes. Um, if you have read Lenin's Cafe, the short story of mine, which was featured, which is a part of the Japanese Wife collection. Uh, that is uh, perhaps the only autobiographical or derived from my life that I've written is a story about an imaginary conversation between me and my father, who I meet in Zurich 11 years after he's passed away. Okay. So I met my father 11 years after his death in Zurich at the Limbat Quay, where gulls come to feed. This is the opening line of that story. And I wrote it because my father suddenly passed away when I was a graduate student in America. He died of a heart attack. And there's a lot of unfinished business between me and my father. So in fictional form, I met him after his death. And we carried on a conversation, a conversation that we never had a chance to properly engage in. Okay. Um, but barring that, uh, there, there, there are some commentators who've said that uh, because you're a Bengali, and Bengal is of this particular pension for 19th century Bengal. Uh, is the character of Bohim, uh, Hiranagar Chakravarti's uncle in the OPM Clark, Kunal Basu in disguise? You know, so this Bohim is a character who's an enlightened young Bengal, okay, flamboyant, uh, well-read, um, uh, you know, a, a foppish when it comes to dress dresses, uh, indulgent when it comes to behavior. He introduces Hiran to the stage. He takes him out to the, you know, to the uh, forbidden parts of the city. He in introduces him to drinking. Okay, he's both serious yet non-serious. Okay, is that you? Well, maybe. Uh, maybe there's some. <laughs> maybe there's some. Maybe there's some traces of that. Um, but uh, by and large, I've stayed away from personal autobiography. Uh, in terms of creating characters. There's no favorite character as such, but there's some characters for whom I still weep. Um, the Miniaturist, which is a novel that I um, go back to reading in, when I'm despondent. Uh, it was just asked, is there a book that I go back to read? I mean, uh, I'm not saying this because I've, I've written it, but because this is a novel about an artist who's a failed artist failed in the eyes of the world. So when I feel that in the eyes of the world I have failed as a writer, and that brings its sadness and despondence, I go back to reading Behazad's story. Okay. Uh, and so uh, there are some characters, uh, Dr. Das, uh, that I uh, have, have remained with me. And I would go back and revisit and in some point, at some points in my life. Uh, but by and large, I've stayed away from writing about uh, fashion uh, characters out of my wife, my mother-in-law, <laughs> uh, which is a very dangerous pursuit, if you ask me. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very, very nice. Let us, uh, let us uh, uh, end on that note that you may weep for Behzad, 
but I don't think you have any occasion to equate yourself with Behzad because I do not remember any novel that you have written that has not been well appreciated and that has not you know, inspired and sparked the mm, imagination of your readers. So more strength to you and more ink in your pen and a lot of more writing. Yes? Oh, Ma Ma oh. Ma 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 <laughs> yes, okay, okay. So you see, nobody's willing to leave you. That is Dr. Nilanjana Chatterjee. Yeah. She's my student and a present academic now. Go ahead. No, actually, I just wanted to share a moment from 2005 because today Sir has talked about death and despondence so many times. And this is a face which actually I couldn't recognize because I knew a man in 2005 who came to Bordhaman University in black denim shirt. <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was smiling and he was, you know, I mean, he was taking total control of the room and students who wanted to do PhD on him were jotting down things and some of them have successfully finished their PhD on him. But yes. I was so much engrossed and, you know, the, I, I, I was ma'am sharing with you that day that when he yes. came, he introduced himself by situating the importance of Bardhuan rail station in his days of youth. <laughs> when that was a halting station for him to go to Shantan His days of courting, you should say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and 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 before leaving, he just left with an everlasting smile, and I and I request him to smile that everlasting smile once again in these dark, dark days. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and it's always good to reconnect with people that uh, are with individuals that uh, you know I've met earlier, and in. In different uh, places, and um, I do remember uh, the session in about the one. I think it was racist, right? The novel that I was uh, talking yes, about. Yes. yes. Right. I, I remember I, your black denim shirt. All <laughs> right. <laughs> I had uh, gone back to the university, uh, to your university uh, again, but that was much later. Uh, but, but this one, I do remember uh, uh, in that big auditorium, um, many, many students. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I quite I enjoyed myself. I enjoyed myself. You know, it's very gratifying to an author. We live our lives in caves. At least I live my life in a cave, which is my desk in Oxford and in Kolkata. Okay? And the only time we get to meet other human beings is when I'm, when I'm talking uh, in, a, in a presentation or in a discussion like this. And it's very gratifying to, to engage. Otherwise, you know what it feels like? It feels like that I'm writing for the wall in front of me. Okay. And, uh, and so uh, thank you for bringing it up and thank you for sharing that experience. Thank you, sir. Thank you yes, so much. I, I think also that he's one of those rare authors who have got so much international acclaim, but he never, uh, you know, misses the chance of visiting into the interiors of anywhere. Because I remember when I very tentatively asked him, because my our university head was very eager to have him in Cardinal Jewel University, a new fledgling university, and I tentatively asked him, I mean, do you want? They are wanting you. I mean, if you want, don't want. I can always say and all. And he said, Why? Sure. So, you know, sort of, and he yes. did come and uh, take that long journey. But Shorbani, I had disappointed Shorab once because he had, he had indeed asked me to uh, speak yes. in, in a yes. seminar. But, yes. you know, the reason for that, the reason was I was finishing my new novel, which I have now finished and is off to my agent. Um, but when I'm in the throes of finishing a novel, uh, I become very... I'm not very communicative, and it's very difficult for me to engage in a in a in a in a session like this. Because, look, I've been an academic for 37 years, so I know that unless I provide all I can to you during this session, that I would be letting you down. Okay? And I and and I would not want to do that. So sorry, Shorab. I hope I've made up for okay. it. It doesn't matter. Finally, the hope comes true. The the dream comes true, actually. Uh, thank you very much. I'm truly overwhelmed by your presence and humbled by you.
Uh, yes, he did tell me that he couldn't come to my college at that time. Now, Shorbanidhi is up to you whether you can somehow <laughs> inspire him to attend this seminar. Yes, so, yes. thank I you really so much. You to speak. And we yes. apologize again for having kept you waiting. I oh, mean, so uh, it was, uh, it is yes, actually uh, unforgivable, but well, it happened. These nets are being very. No, no, no. We, 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 we are, it happens everywhere, every time. Uh, but <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a very impatient man. <laughs> so, so waiting is not the best of sensations for me, but I, yes, I, I know, I know. Things and things for but thank you for being so gracious about it. And as you can see, take your time to read these comments and you will see how many hearts you have touched today. I mean, that makes yeah. our day because people, you have done the job, the magic, but people are thanking us. So we are taking the credit yes. for your wonderful session. Yes. Thank the you so much, yes. uh, Kunal for Thank coming you. and for uh, you know making this grand finale a truly grand finale truly today. Grand. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. 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 We will now have this, uh, uh, have a little uh, two minutes. I implore the audience to remain. I request our IQAC coordinator of TDB College, Rani Ganj, uh, to uh, unmute and um, open his video. Shourab. Please, uh, you, you say your bit, and then uh, Shorbindu will complete the session. OK, OK. Uh, actually, uh, the responsibility is on my shoulder, uh, being the IQC coordinator of my college. Actually, I want to uh, thank everyone, uh, my, uh, the principal of our college, Dr. Vijay Kandube, my faculty members of the Department of English, my colleagues, uh, the principal, sir, of TDB College, the faculty members of the uh, Department of English of TDP College, all the participants, the audience, without you, this, this webinar couldn't have been possible. Uh, and uh, this is the, actually, this is the third session that, uh, that our college is uh, organizing at this time. We're collaborating with Shorbanidi. And I, I, I extend my sincerest thanks and gratitude to Shorbanidi. She's such a sweet person uh, and, and, and so much dedicated. Uh, so much dedicated and she always keeps saying that uh, to, but i don't i don't feel that she's growing older because uh, when, whenever when, yes uh, yes youngest youngest whenever i see her she she always smiles so beautifully and youthfully so amuse uh, never grows old <laughs> yes of course amuse never grows old so uh, uh, but we have a very important announcements today. Some some very important announcements today. Well, me, if, may I may I may I interrupt? Um, Sharpani may be as uh, old as the uh, um, I mean you know as you can say, but she's as young as the wind, the breeze, and the earth. Yes, yes. I don't uh, say she says. Thank you, Just like you, just like you, we make a pair. <laughs> <laughs> An awesome interview and a lovely, lovely three days of, I mean, you know, Thank what you. do you call it? Cerebral bonanza. So it was wonderful. Thank you very much Thank to you. both the colleges. Thank you, Thank you madam, for joining us, for supporting Thank us. Thank you. you. Thank you. I could we, we are I could indebted to you. All, your though I would have loved to. I had yeah. some, uh, I mean, you know, business in the university. Naturally, you all know that. I mean, yes. you know, yes. we are busy with the exams and things. Next time we but will call you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. But it was very interesting. And Thank I you. was tempted to tell Kunal Basu that when Sarbani said that he has touched hearts, I mm -hmm. was just going to tell him he has stolen hearts. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, propriety stopped me. Maybe <laughs> I'm also getting moved. <laughs> I never, I never knew that you much cared for propriety. <laughs> we <don't. laughs> no, with, with all the junior students and things, all of them watching, they would wonder what is this old lady doing out here. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, now, now, okay, now let, okay, us go, on, yes, let, us, let us go back to the serious business. Uh, the first announcement is that we are jointly uh, publishing, editing a book on, on post-colonialism or post-colonial studies, uh, me and Shorbani and uh, the, uh, some of the speakers of the uh, of the webinar series, uh, they 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 will contribute to that very edited volume, and we shall also uh, prepare a CFP for the uh, 
for anyone who is interested to send his or her abstract, the 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 entire CFP will be available uh, on the Facebook pages and and other portals like openedu So please uh, check the CFP and if you are interested, you can contribute papers in that edited volume. It will be uh, jointly edited by me and uh, Dr. Shalbani Banerjee. The second announcement is the announcement is that uh, we shall send you mail you a feedback form. Okay, so please fill in the feedback form and fill in carefully so that uh, actually we shall derive the information from both your registration forms and from your feedback forms. But there are certain serious errors in your registration forms. I have found those information will be used for 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 the certificates okay so if there is any error from your side the error will be visible on your certificate so be very careful while filling in the uh, feedback forms okay so uh, these two announcements uh, i i had to make and i have uh, I, I think i have uh, completed my duty sarvanidhi now it is over to you sarvanidhi again uh, unmute yourself unmute yourself sarvanidhi unmute yourself uh, uh, request Professor Shorbindu Bikash Dhar, convener of uh, coordinator of our IQAC um, committee of TTP College Raniganj to deliver his vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Shorbanidi. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. perfectly. Now, as we have moved uh, almost to the end of this three day long international wave lecture series. And it is my honor to propose a formal vote of thanks in this occasion. Myself, as introduced by uh, respected Shorbani, uh, Dr. Shorbani Bikas Dhar, coordinator of IQAC, Chibini Devi Halotia College, Raniganj. On behalf of the organizers of this event, I take this opportunity to thank all the speakers for gracing this lecture series through their August presence and sharing with us, their thoughts, opinions, and ideas. As we know, we are now passing through a very harsh time due to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation. But at the same time, it has some opportunities too. This pandemic has taught us the way to stay connected virtually. Especially, it has benefited the academia. And in this context, during this web lecture series, we are fortunate enough to have with us some of the best thinkers and theorists of English literature from all over the world. We had with us Professor Bill Ascroft from Australia, Professor Fiona McCann, Professor Clary Omhorve from France, Professor Bivash Choudhury uh, from Guwahati University, India, Professor uh, Thomas Lin from USA and uh, we have just ended a wonderful session with eminent novelist and short story writer Dr. Kunal Basu. We are grateful to all our respected resource persons for vividly discussing various aspects of contemporary trends in post-colonialism in English literature. We are all inspired by your great words, really. Organizing a joint event like this requires an enor enormous planning and hard work that I think. And here I like to congratulate um, the joint conveners of this event, Dr. Shodak Kumar Nag, uh, head of the Department of English, Ondathana Mahavidyalaya, Mr. Sujit Malik, head Department of English, Sriveni Devi Bhalutia College at present for making this lecture series a reality. Again, congratulations to both of you. Here, I must appreciate the cooperation of all the faculty members of English departments of both the colleges to make this event a grand success. It is only their dedication that has proved this venture into a fruitful one. In this regard, our heartfelt thanks are also due to Dr. Bijay Kant Dubey, Principal, Ondathana Mahavidyalaya, and Dr. Ashish Kumar Dev, 
प्रिंसिपल त्रिवेणी देवी भालुटिया कॉलेज रानीगंज विदाउट देयर सपोर्ट एंड एनकरेजमेंट दिस इवेंट वुड नॉट हैव बीन पॉसिबल आई वुड आल्सो लाइक टू थैंक डॉक्टर शौरबानी मुखर्जी एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इन द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश इन आवर कॉलेज इट इज हर एंथुसियास्टिक सपोर्ट एंड प्लानिंग दैट हैज हेल्प्ड अस अ लॉट टू मेक दिस इवेंट अ ग्रैंड सक्सेस लास्ट लास्ट बट नॉट द लीस्ट आई वुड लाइक टू एक्सटेंड special thanks to this nice audience and all our beloved students of both the colleges for their enormous cooperation in organizing uh, this event i end here with a positive hope that such academic collaboration and cooperation will be continued between these two colleges in future too so stay healthy stay safe thanks that's from my end it is over to shorbani di now uh, professor thar i need your sir yes i have okay. uh, thank you so much for that very uh, brief but very exhaustive uh, official vote of thanks and thank you for your constant support that nobody can see on the screen but you have been behind and have been guiding me and helping me regarding all this thank you so much and i thank i i want to mention a very very special thanks to my very very young brother dr shourab kumar nag uh, without whose inspiration this could not have happened it was his idea and it was both our executions with the help of our respected departments i need to uh, mention specially uh, uh, shujit malik uh, sumbul nasim arunima karmakar pankaj uh, sharan uh, shujit amader shobhik datto and shani nath all of them together without as shourab doesn't listen to me but these old bones could not have moved without so much young support so thank you thank you everybody for this wonderful grand finale it is your my, pleasure my pleasure shobhani ji my pleasure <laughs> thank you so much okay, okay. so he was leave thank you very much thank you everyone Thank, thank you dr king thank you bye miss good night bye, bye. good thank night you. good night everyone thank you for all your presence bye take care miss bye bye you too you too take care thank you